I really love my Venom Green Boron 0.2, but it hasn't always been the case. In fact, it wasn't even a planned purchase. I just saw a bargain online, and from hearsay I knew warrants are supposed to be great. But along the way, there were quite a few things I wasn't prepared for. Let's dive right in. Welcome back factory owners. Today I'm telling you why in my opinion tiny printers deserve more love and how I went from viewing the Voron 0.2 as a neat gimmick to making it my main workhorse. Now some of you might remember that I once thought getting the biggest printer available is a good idea. Now how come that turned into the complete opposite? It all began with me seeing a bargain offer for a Voron 0.2 from the company Physitech. Physitc? Physits? Let me know how that's pronounced, I have no idea. The price was around 350, so 350 euros, and I already had a Raspberry Pi 3 lying around, so I thought, why not go for it? Of course, I chose the Venom Green profiles. Today, they're only selling black, that's really a shame. Since it shipped from Europe, it already arrived the next day. I hadn't even prepared any part yet, but I still had some spools of black ASA lying around that we had from the pandemic, where Extruder gave special discounts for the people printing face shields. We didn't just grift the code, we really printed face shields. I also had a spool of green nice ABS from 3D Jake lying around, though I have no idea what's nice about it. It still smells and it's still warp, so you tell me. I started printing parts immediately, but the first ones failed miserably. I didn't have my ABS technique nailed down. I went online and did a bit of research. Turns out the key to printing ABS with success is turning on the part cooling fan. I couldn't believe it myself at first, but the results really spoke for themselves. Seems like we've been lied to the whole time. Let me know if you want to see a video on how I did that. With the first few parts printed and the rest still in production, I could already start assembling. And right from the start, I was hit with a recurring theme from Physitech. They added some clever upgrades. Only thing is, there was no explanation in the box and they also added all the stock parts. So you had to figure out yourself where to use those upgrade parts. You'll find out about all those parts over the course of this video. For example, they added 10 PCBs with 6x72 millimeters, a few holes in them and no circuitry at all. Now I want you to stop the video and let me know in the comments what you think those parts are used for. Don't cheat and skip ahead, I'll show you the solution in a bit. While the Prusa Mark III was busy with a 20 hour print, I found out that I needed nut carriers to mount the linear rails. The only way I saw out of this is reviving my trusty CR10 for an express print of those. Being a bit impatient, I tried to make it print as fast as possible. So I set the jerk value quite a bit higher than default. The first layer was fine, since it printed considerably slower, but in the second layer I was in for a surprise. Turns out large print beds don't like to be jerked around, and I produced the most epic layer shift I've ever witnessed. You could literally see and hear it skip dozens of steps with every back and forth movement. So there I was, starting over again and waiting the 15 minutes it takes that big heat bed to get up to temperature again. On the second attempt, I used less jerk and managed to finish those nut carriers. The only thing is, I printed on a piece of IKEA mirror and used Magiku to make the ABS stick. And it stuck. It stuck so well that it literally ripped out pieces of glass while removing it. That stuff is just unbelievable for bad adhesion. But at least I managed to save two of those nut carriers for now. Back at my desk, I started putting in those nut carriers and tightening down the linear rails. At that point I also found out that Physetic has built videos on their YouTube channel which they only uploaded a few days prior. The background music was making me feel like I was stuck in a Chinese restaurant for hours, but it was the only way to find out where those special parts are used. I noticed they didn't use any nut carriers to tighten down the linear rails. Instead they inserted those PCBs that I mentioned earlier into the aluminium profile and tightened down the linear rails with them. That's something I would never have guessed myself. To my surprise, that worked really well. I usually tighten down screws pretty hard, but the PCBs had no issue taking that force. Next surprise was the bed holder. The original Warren design uses aluminium profiles and printed parts to make a bed holder. Another popular option is the Kirigami bed, which is made of bent sheet metal. But Physetic seemed to be having a CNC machine for aluminium on hand, so they just milled one out of a solid block of aluminium. Remember that I told you that they also included all the original parts from the bill of material? Yes, since I didn't know any better, I also printed out those plastic parts for the bed and I also have those aluminium profiles, but I just have no use for them. As far as I remember, that was also the first occurrence where you needed to print special physetic parts that you won't find in the original um, GitHub repository, just in the physetic one. A spacer was necessary to have the drag chain sit in the right position with the built aluminium bed holder. 
The wiring of the print bit was done with Vago connectors, for which you needed a special holder that was also not in the original Voron repository. While the aluminium bed holder is pretty sturdy, it also has a minor shortcoming. The hole for the screw and springs to fit in is quite a bit larger than the springs, so the bed can move back and forth a few millimeters. To mitigate that, I printed my own spacers so the bed cannot move anymore. The print bed itself features two screws where the removable build plate is aligned with. Those screws are a bit too long. One I could just mitigate by adding a spacer, and the other one I needed to file down a bit so that the nozzle is not colliding with them. Next strange thing was with assembling the feet. I bought the kit right when revision 1 with a filament runout sensor came out, but it was not revision 1, and they didn't include the filament runout sensor. But they did include the fittings for passing through the Bowden tube. I just ended up using the regular foot with a pass-through Bowden tube though. The X carriage is another one of those upgrade parts. They included an extra light milled aluminium beam with integrated threads, making it a double whammy for upgrade parts, since they made an upgrade part, the PCBs, obsolete with another upgrade part. Upgradeception. When it came to toolet assembly, I once again learned that I printed parts that were already superseded. Instead of using those plastic parts, they included metal standoffs for the extruder motor. The installation of the part cooling fan, I managed to screw up myself, without any confusion from Fizetic. I managed to put in one of those fans blowing to the front instead of down, and you could even see that it was not centered in its hole, but I didn't take the hint. Instead, I shaved off some material when the fin started to rub and thought that it was just not very good fit. Initially, I thought the mini stealth burner just didn't have good airflow or the Chinese fans were not that good. I made sure to give myself a good pat on the back for such an achievement when I figured out what went wrong. The kit came with a cheap V6 clone hotend with a PTFE lined heat brake and also an all metal one for the user to swap out. It worked fine, but it was a bit heavy, so I swapped it out for a V6 clone with a ceramic heater for which I needed to design an adapter myself. I also needed to shorten the heatsink and drill and tap some holes to make it fit, but hey, it was only 20 bucks. After a few prints, I thought the cheap ceramic heater core already broke. Turns out it wasn't the reason for the random hot end not heating at expected rates error from Clipper, but we'll find that out later. For the electronics, Fizetic included their self-developed Cheetah V3 microcontroller board and also a wiring diagram, finally some documentation. But they didn't have a full documentation on their website. On the website, the most recent model was still version 2. The board worked fine for me so far, but it emits a pretty substantial capacitor squeal at all times. It's not a big deal when printing though. A wiring duct was also included and made doing clean wiring a breeze. Instead of routing all the wires directly to the tool head, they included the so-called umbilical PCB. That means you have a PCB on the tool head and a PCB in the chamber and you connect them with a 14-pin Molex connector. The PCB also includes a chamber thermistor for temperature measurements. Like the Vago connector terminal, this one is also a community design. At that time, I didn't expect the umbilical to become the fuel of my nightmares. With everything wired up, I calibrated the extruder, leveled the bed and did a first layer test. The first layer looked promising, so I went on to do a pressure advance calibration. That means the extruder stops extruding a few milliseconds before it reaches an edge, so that it doesn't over extrude on those edges. The test was done in three layers. The first one looked great, but the other two didn't. I figured since it was generated G-code, it must have been an error with the G-code. But the first real prints showed the same pattern. The first three layers looked extremely over-extruded and the rest of the model turned out fine. Now's your chance to pause the video and make a guess where you think that issue came from. And thanks for applying some solid infill to the like button while you're at it. Now back to the analysis of the issue. I can smell the failure! Watching closely while printing, I noticed that the bed didn't seem to move for the first three layers while printing. On the Warren 0.2, the homing position is at 120 mm all the way at the bottom, and the bed could move up until 0.6 mm, and after that it didn't seem to move. Instead, it just flexed and twisted the lead screw and didn't move anymore. The reason for that, where the end stops. According to the manual, they should be mounted directly touching the linear rail, but in my case that didn't work out, so I moved them one millimeter away from the linear rails and after that the heat bed was free to move. The only logical explanation for that is the carriages of the linear rails from the Fizetic kit must be bigger than the ones the Warren team used for their design. With the Z-axis fixed, the Warren now printed nice and reliable. And I just happened to need some spare parts. Turns out the Prusa Mark III didn't like the 48 hours of non-stop printing ABS and rewarded me with a horribly warped heatbed cover. A colleague of mine had the same issue and printing another heatbed cover in ABS just resulted in the same warped part a few hours later. 
So one of my first prints under Warren 0.2 was a heat bed cover printed in polycarbonate. Hopefully to never have that issue again. The part turned out great and the combination of a pulsing LED and clear polycarbonate results in a really awesome glowing effect. I cranked up the speed and installed some LEDs to see more of the mesmerizing printing action. For the general chamber lighting I used some knockoff NeoPixels which integrate really nicely with the clipper interface. The mini stealth burner toolhead has some dedicated spots for Adafruit sequin LEDs which can be used to illuminate the nozzle. I combined those with a MOSFET as a simple switch so I can use a custom button and clipper to turn them on and off on demand. I also added a cheap Raspberry Pi camera with a custom case for remote observation. You can't see the first few layers because of its mounting position, but it's good enough to check in on the print's integrity every now and then. From the factory the focus was not suited for the low distance to the print bed, but you can adjust that using some pliers and breaking loose the lens and screwing it out a bit. Then it looks perfectly sharp. From there printing went good and was fun to watch. And by the way, if you want to learn my approach to designing and printing, I made a free guide for you I linked in the description. So everything was hunky-dory, right? No wait, there was still something I teasered before. I randomly got hot end not heating at expected rate errors. Initially I thought it was the cheap ceramic hot end I installed, so I swapped it out for the Kids V6 and also managed to finish the print I was on. But then the error appeared again. I checked all the wiring and also measured all of them with a multimeter, but I couldn't find any issue. I thought it must be the umbilical cable, but when I removed and measured it, there were no issues, not even when I was flexing it heavily. I had a few discussions on the warrant discord and they also told me it must be in the wiring. I connected the multimeter directly to the PCBs and started moving the toolhead around and I finally was able to reproduce the issue. After inspecting the Molex connectors closely, I noticed that the female sides were a bit more loose than they should be, so I used a pair of pliers to make them a bit tighter. This mitigated the issue for a while, but the cable itself was just too stiff. It even made the sensorless homing fail at some times, which resulted in parts that were printed off-center. But this was not a big issue when the part was not as big as the print bed. I finally ordered some very flexible silicone cables and Molex connectors. Those connectors are actually not that easy to find. And cutting 14 wires and making 28 crimp connections is fun. With the cable upgrade the machine is finally working error free. And now the thing you all came for. My reasons why I made this machine my main workhorse, dethroning my Prusa Mark III. Probably the biggest reason, that machine is just insanely fast. You can get prototypes in one third of the time it would take the Prusa and it's also really mesmerizing to watch. The tiny heat bed doesn't warp, so you only need to adjust it once. There's no need for a bed calibration process at the start of the print. The small chamber also heats up pretty fast, so it's perfect for technical materials like ABS and polycarbonate. Another neat byproduct of that is that it doesn't waste much energy because the heat bed is so small. In the case of the Warren 0.2, the webcam integrates integrates really nicely and doesn't need any extra space outside of the chamber. In case you want to show a friend how 3D printing works or maybe even do some on-site prototyping, this machine is really easy to transport. Clipper also brings some very nice benefits with it, but it's not specific to tiny printers. Of course, parts printed very fast don't look as nice as parts printed slowly and you could also turn down the printing speed, but where's the fun in that? And that's it for today. If you want to see more, you can subscribe over here or watch another one over there. See you in the next one.